Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stefano Stabellini and I work for AMD and I'm, I'm one of the Xen maintainers. And my name is uh, Bruce Ashfield. I uh, am a maintainer of uh, Lopper and uh, I work in the Yocto project for my other open source work and I am also uh, working for AMD. All right, so um, I would like to talk to you about uh, a little bit about system device tree. Um, Next slide, uh, please. So in today's uh, environment, uh, there are often cases where there are multiple CPU clusters uh, with um, heterogeneous CPU clusters such as uh, Cortex-Rs, Microblades, Cortex-As, where more traditionally Linux runs. Uh, and in the Cortex-As uh, processors, uh, there are usually multiple execution levels. Um, there, are, there is user space, there is kernel space, there is secure uh, execution level, like secure year one, where Opti runs. Uh, there is trusted firmware running at year three. And all of these components uh, are completely independent from each other. Uh, so, uh, it's natural in this environment to, uh, you know, to, to, to have to, you know, to, to think about multiple execution domains. There is an execution domain for Linux, there is an execution domain for Zephyr, and there is an execution domain for Opti, and so on. Um, so it's natural to, to have a full system that is uh, divided up into multiple domain with each component being the owner, each software component with the owner and the user of a, of a specific set of hardware. So in such an environment so rich in terms of multiple heterogeneous uh, clusters as well as heterogeneous software components, we need a way to describe and configure the full system. And system device tree is the answer to this, to this, to this problem. Uh, system device tree is an extension to device tree to describe everything there is. So traditionally, a device tree only describes uh, what, is what is available for one uh, component for one OS, such as Linux. Uh, so you will end up having one device tree for Linux, one device tree for Zephyr, one device tree for Opti, and all of them will be different. So with system by device tree, you can describe everything there is with a multi-view um, angle, meaning that you can describe multiple different address spaces, uh, and you can also express differences in what Linux can see compared to what Opti can see compared to what Zephyr can see. In addition, there is a configuration aspect um, of, the, uh, of the problem. Uh, next slide, um, please. Uh, the configuration of what is the set of devices that we want for um, uh, U-Boot, what are the set of, and, and Linux, what, are, what is the set of devices that we want to enable for Zephyr on, in another domain, and what is the set of devices that we want to make sure are only usable from secure world. So all of this <clears throat> is what system device tree is about. The, the um, description of a full SOC, including multiple heterogeneous um, CPU clusters, as well as um, OSs, and the configuration of them. So which domain can access which devices? Um, and um, uh, so, so you can imagine really taking a full, uh, a full SOC design and carving out uh, domains and each domain having a subset of the hardware and which subsets exactly is also expressed by system device tree. Next to you, um, Bruce. Yeah, and I'm, my part of the presentation is something I've been working on uh, with collaborating with Stefano and the system device tree um, specification, uh, if you will, is a, a tool called um, Lopper. Um, it's something that, we, that we've been working on for almost three years now. I wouldn't say we've been working on it full out in the sense of uh, continuous development, but we introduced the idea and the concept at the same time we were talking about system device tree because we knew uh, that some of the extensions and some of the way that the information is uh, globally uh, described, if you will, that we would need some sort of tool to take the system device tree and produce um, other device trees in the format that an existing RTOS or uh, Linux would expect because we couldn't expect um, these operating systems to immediately be able to consume or we might not expect them ever to consume uh, a system device tree. So there, there, there's lots of um, device tree libraries and, and 
little tools and of course um, common things like said and you know you can script and, and pull together um, sort of a lot of ad hoc ways to to manipulate the the dts or the source files or even the dtbs but we wanted something that we could um, have a defined interface uh, a defined you know something that would be able to in a controlled way um, analyze and manipulate um, device trees so that is what it is now transformed into which is um, not just for pruning um, uh, device trees which is our initial idea was to remove the information from a system device tree that you need for an os but it's now a sort of a framework for manipulating system device trees and transforming the information contained uh, within a uh, device tree splitting it joining it and doing other things um, we can produce multiple different types of output whether it be um, configuration files, YAML files, DTS, DTBs, and um, it's flexible in the sense of those are what we currently support, but we could add more and plan to add actually more inputs and output format types in the future. Um, it is flexible to integrate into um, different types of workflows, uh, which we'll see in our demo, and that it is completely data driven in the sense that you know, we, we can do things, um, the tool itself does not understand what a system device tree is. It doesn't understand what you may or may not want in and out of a system device tree, but the, the details of what it needs to do are inputs to the tool and it executes what's asked. And that is where the actual intelligence or the, the, the semantics would be. Uh, 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 just some quick details um, about Lopper itself. It is open source BSD3 license. Uh, I have links to where you can find the GitHub on the, it's on, it's part of the device tree org uh, GitHub, and it does get released as a PyPy um, patch package as well. So you can actually uh, install it quite quickly and, and do a test run. Um, as I mentioned, obviously it's, it's on PyPy, it's written in Python, Python, and it has pluggable uh, backends um, to manipulate uh, device uh, DTBs. Um, and it also has um, the ability to add additional logic components in the future. Um, it does support these, uh, the data that I mentioned, uh, the inputs are these unit operations, if you will, which are simple operations to say, rename a, a, a property, delete a node, um, add a new node. So those are called LOPs uh, and we can feed those in as an input and it will, they will be applied to the tree or we can actually implement uh, complex um, Python assist modules, which is what will be part of the, the demo today. And of course, depending on what you're doing, you can use one, both, or none, uh, uh, whatever you need. Um, and it, one, of the, one of the things that it does do always is uh, a level of validation and consistency checking um, on the, uh, the output tree. So you know, if you have a, an invalid p handle or, or things like that it, it is always running in a mode that will do some level of consistency checking uh, and we plan to add more um, when viewed from a, a system point of view in the future um, so just to go in a little bit closer on the framework part of it and so we kind of use it now as a common base for tooling requiring that to query or inquire uh, or manipulating a device tree. As I mentioned, you can do a lot of this, of course, with grep and set and awk and uh, whatever your favorite tool is, but um, you would have, it's very uh, one-off uh, at, at that point. And uh, it's hard to extend it to some of the more complex logic that, 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 that we envision and we'll even show in the demo. But built into Lopper itself, what I'm saying is it can do these core tree manipulations, you know, node merging, it can merge multiple trees. It understands what the DTS tree should look like, the syntax, what a property is, and these sort of things. But it it doesn't understand how they really interrelate because that's uh, that's done in these these assists. It can do DTS, DTB, YAML. It parses with either libftt or dtlib um, from Zephyr. It manages these assists and lot files to make sure they're applied in order to make sure they do same things to the tree. It does the consistency checking that I mentioned. And there's a set of building up of uh, manipulation libraries and routines that we can use in the lot files 
or in the assist. So these are part of, you know, the core of Lopper. They're always there. They're always available. Then there is the framework portion, which means there's optional plugins and or assists, if you will. And this is where they provide logic, semantics, and sort of context awareness of what uh, we want Lopper to do. So this is where you know we have things that are front ends about domains and partitioning that Stefano was uh, mentioning in the, the SOC picture where you might need to do some partitioning. It can do YAML expansion on a front end as a description of the domains. It has a bunch of uh, back ends that are built in. You can find in the tree right now, you know, the system device tree pruning, some example RTOS, bare metal back end uh, generation assists. It has um, a security and a partitioning back end for subsystem. It can generate uh, some firewall information, which is uh, in progress. It started. Um, and, 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 any number of them. You can find them in the tree. I, I won't bother going through them all. Um, you know, another backend assist is sort of that more detailed device level tree analysis and modification, which is sort of what we're going to be showing in the demo. Um, and there is a, a little REST API uh, that we plan to use in the future to support other tooling interacting with the information that Lopper um, reads and pulls and can represent uh, of the, the system device tree. Uh, visually, these components that I just mentioned, this is, uh, you know, what it looks like in, in a normal flow where we start from the left where we take inputs, which are all sort of standard based inputs. They're nothing that we have created. They're either YAML files, DTS files, LOP files, um, which would be a system device tree, a board uh, device tree and overlays, you know, they're, they're, they're read in through these front ends. Um, they go through an importer and they're part of Lopper core. At that moment, we then apply, we have assists or LOPs or translations that are applied to those, um, uh, to that rep internal representation of all of that information. And then on the back end, we go through uh, an exporter, which means we could write out YAML, uh, DTS, DTB, or, or something custom, which is what we use to write out device drivers for bare metal, configuration for a Yocto build, um, information that a specific RTOS might need. Um, and this is, of course, the path through is all on what, how you uh, run uh, Lopper on the command line or how you wrap it. And now we're back to Stefano to talk about Zen partial device trees. Yeah, so I would like to discuss partial device tree a little bit um, because it introduces um, a problem, a solution and a problem that is, this is very actually widespread in these uh, static partitioning configurations that goes way beyond Zen, beyond any single hypervisor and also beyond hypervisor in general because you have the same problem also with multiple domains running on different CPU clusters. And the problem is how do you configure the devices that you want to be assigned to each of these domains? Like the whole idea of a domain is that it includes uh, software like Linux and the CPU cluster is running on like the Cortex A's and then the devices that is uh, accessing such as Ethernet or a timer. So, um, uh, you know, that, that means you need to be able to specify individually which devices are assigned to each of these domains. And this domain, as I, as I mentioned, could be imagine Zephyr on the Cortex-Rs, uh, driving um, so, something in programmable logic, or it could be a Xen VM on the Cortex-As. Uh, so and that's where we get into the Xen specific part. So I'll show you how Xen handled this problem uh, today uh, with all the Xen specific details now and then I will abstract out to, to discuss the more generic problem and how Lopper can help solve it. So today what Xen does, it, it uses what we call Xen pa uh, a partial device tree and it's something that predates overlays and but it's kind of similar in the intent to device tree overlays. So you will put the description of the device or devices that is, are accessible from the guest into a, its own special device tree with a top level node called pass-through. And uh, like you see on the, on the slide on the right, 
everything under the top level node called pass through, everything underneath it, it will be copied into the guest device tree. Uh, and it's done for two reasons. So, so the primary reason is the description, right? The, so that you can describe for the guest uh, the, what, what's available. So you want to expose a timer to your guest, you put it in there, it gets copied into the guest device tree so the guest tab boot can read it. Um, it's not just that, so there are also a couple of special design specific properties uh, for uh, configuring device assignment. Uh, like you see in the example, there is Xen force assigned without a UMU, Xen reg, and Xen path. So Xen that are the last three that you see under the timer node. So Xen reg is maybe the most important one and is to specify the memory mapping, the address mappings for the device. That can be one-to-one, -one, like in the example you see on the screen, but you can also map the MMIO region of a device to a different location inside your guest if you want to. And um, Xen path is used for um, it's used for IOMMU configuration and is a link to the corresponding node in the host device tree. Xen force assigned without a UMMU is for the cases where uh, an IOMMU is actually not needed. For instance, because the device is not a DMA mastering device. Like in this case, the timer is not a DMA mastering device, so there is no need to configure the IOMMU. So how do you start by generating something like that? So up until now, it was done entirely by hand. So somebody had to go and take the timer node on the host device tree, copy paste it into this new device tree under the pass-through node and start making edits, like removing things that are not wanted and adding the exam properties. The problem is it's a bit difficult. So next slide, Bruce. Um, so first of all, the exam specific properties are not few. And second of all, the other modification are even harder. So this is a full list of exam specific modification needs to be done. So, uh, you know, like I said, Zen, Zen Reg, the first one for memory mapping, Zen Pass to point to the corresponding uh, host node. Zen Force Assign without a UMMU when a UMMU configurations are not necessary. Zen Interrupt Parents also need to be changed to be FDE8, this magic number. And that is because Interrupt Parents is pointing to the Interrupt Controller. And if you copy paste the node from the host device tree, you will get a link to the host interrupt controller, which is not the one that's going to be available in the guest. The guest is going to get a virtual interrupt controller node, new and generated by Xen. So you need, in order to point to the right interrupt controller, you need to change interrupt parent to be 0xfde8. Uh, IOMMU's properties, if any, need to be removed. That's because when I, an IOMMU is available, Xen is going to use it, and typically the guest cannot use it. So you need to hide the IOMMU from the guest. And the last uh, detail is in the host device tree node, not the guest, so not the one under pass through, the host device tree node, you need to add Xen pass through under each of the nodes for devices that you want to assign. The reason to do that is if you don't do that, DOM0, the first guest, will always get all devices by default for simplicity of configuration. So if you want to instead give one of the devices to another guest, first you need to tell Zen, do not give it straight away to DOM0. Otherwise, it's going to be already in DOM0 and you cannot take it away. And to do that, you just add Xen pass through under the host device reno. Now, if you look at all of these changes, they're not easy, like they're, 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 not, um, they're not trivial, uh, but they're also not extremely difficult. All of these are kind of straightforward, like Zen reg, it can be automatically calculated from the reg property. Uh, the changes to winter parents are static. Removing a UMMU is something you to do all the time. Adding Zen faster is something to do all the time. Uh, so it's easily scriptable. So you, you, like, uh, like Bruce was mentioning earlier, I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to write a script, even a bash script using said that, uh, that makes these changes. The real problem are the other changes required. Next slide, please. So, you know, if you start from the host device node, 
there are a few other things that needs to be done, like because often there are pointers to external dependencies such as clocks, power domains, reset lines. So how do you deal with those? They definitely, they definitely have an effect on the driver behavior. Uh, it cannot be simply be ignored. Now, this is a difficult problem. And this is a generic problem because it's not Zen specific at all. It will happen with any hypervisor. Beyond hypervisors, it will happen even with heterogeneous clusters. So if you have Zephyr running on a separate cluster wanting to drive a device, how are you going to configure Zephyr for that? Right? So, so these, the, the clock, especially the clock dependencies, is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, so next slide, please, uh, Bruce. So this is a more realistic example compared to the one I showed before. The one I showed before was a timer, so it's very, very simple, maybe trivial even. This is an MMC controller, and it more realistically reflects how things actually are in reality. And as you can see, in, beyond the MMC controller, a whole bunch of clocks, as well as a clock controller, had to be added all under the pass-through node so that they can become part of the guest device tree. And the reality is that pin control lines and reset lines power domain can be removed uh, with a bit of lack of functionalities, but you know, the core functionality, you know, everything will still work. Clocks are different. If you remove the clocks properties from the node, often the driver will refuse to continue, will refuse to uh, operate the device completely. So the device will become no, you know, not working. Um, so this is where uh, Lopper comes in to help. So uh, this is not something that can be automatically scripted using Bash and Sed. It, it requires chasing up dependencies of clocks and the clock hierarchy. This is not something that can be easily done by hand. It takes several tries, uh, trial and error, uh, in order to be able to produce something like this. What clocks do you need to import? What clock controllers? Is actually quite difficult. Um, so this problem. Uh, this is one problem where Lopper and system devicery can greatly help. Next slide. Yeah, you go. Right, back. so we're back to me. Uh, so yeah, um, to, to so we set about trying to come up with a solution using Lopper because, as Stefano mentioned, it's error prone and you, it's trial and error, and you have to know. And then what happens when the path changes in the host device tree, and you you know, you have to make this. So there's a maintenance and a and a, and a a lot of issues around coming up with a one-off solution. So um, the answer of how to do it with Lopper, given the information I presented about the framework uh, earlier, is you know to leverage the you know the core Lopper functionality and assist. So you know obviously we want to take uh, the input host device tree, um, bring it into that internal representation. We need to be able to look at the devices, the clocks, the Ethernet, uh, and their dependencies and P handles, and, and in order to get that understanding of what we need to, um, what needs to be considered, um, do tree manipulations, change that interrupt parent to the to the to the magic number, um, drop properties, rename properties, uh, uh, create nodes, um, that sort of thing, and then create an output DTS uh, that is specific uh, to the pass-through device. And then and, and also, as you mentioned, we do need a modification to the host device tree. So we can also ask Lopper to not only generate new information, it can modify uh, the input host uh, device tree uh, in order to make sure the information is consistent uh, between the two. And I'm going to show that it's quite simple to then create yet another assist to um, glue the different bits together into the image, if you will, the bootable information that we need. And that's actually wrapping something that um, uh, Stefano has as, as part of Zen called Image Builder. And there's some scripts there and some information that uh, will generate what U-Boot uh, and, and different parts of the system need. And it was quite trivial to take um, the known written host device tree, the partial device trees, and uh, just wrap uh, Image Builder in, in this in this demo to um, recreate what we need to boot to avoid any need to run things manually uh, to to do the testing. But we did set a couple of boundaries. Again, uh, you know, if we're going to make something very one-off, we might as well try to do it with Bash and a Z script. 
So, you know, there's no hard coded um, uh, Zen knowledge in the sense of the things that Stefano was talking about, the, the, the reg or the no M when an IOMMU is or isn't required. What probably, so we're triggering, uh, we're, we're reading in inputs and what actually happens in the extracting device tree is not checking for the name of a node only, you know, or anything specific like that. It's looking for properties that are or aren't present and using that to um, trigger different bits of information into the, the, the extracted device tree. Uh, I also wanted to split the functionality into that generic problem and reusable components. Um, so there's something that's a generic extraction sort of routine and then something that makes it uh, into what Zen might be looking for. Um, of course, using and creating more LOPR library routines where possible. For example, LOPR has a way to say, look at a node uh, and return me a list of all nodes that are referenced from this node. So uh, things like that, calling those types of library routines as part of these assists so they're not very specific to this solution we're we're following, uh, we want it to be data-driven and have command line options for flexibility because those can always be wrapped um, later on with some of the domain YAML files or, or, or different components that are out there. So you'll see in the demo, there's, you know, excluding and including properties are done with command line options to the assists. Um, so we didn't hard code, should pin control never be processed. It's like, well, you can exclude it or you can exclude another one uh, if you want and that it should work for any device that is a valid uh, pass-through device. So, you know, we're running it on two and we'll test it on more as time passes, but it's not, there's no knowledge that it's not specifically tied to the, the devices that we're, that we're passing through. So, you know, what that looks like uh, in, in, in the implementation itself is it's, it's a pipeline of assists. So we, you know, Lopper can run an assist, it can run many assists, and they can pass information uh, from one assist to another, whether they stuff it in the system device tree, whether they modify the main device tree, or, you know, there's, there's different ways uh, that they can communicate. So in this case, we have a, a pipeline of assists um, uh, that manipulate the, the main host device tree in this case. So there's one called extract, which is you know, very, um, uh, imaginatively named, uh, if you will. Uh, what it does is it knows how to generate a partial or extracted device tree starting from a target node. Um, it does not name it uh, as the, the pass-through node that Zen is looking for. It calls it an extracted node. Um, it annotates what it's done. It pulls the dependencies. It annotates them with the extracted path property. Again, not exactly what Zen wants. It's something a little bit more generic. Uh, once it runs, uh, we then have a plugin called Extract Zen, which uh, gets the main device tree, it gets the extracted tree, and it can then uh, use the Lopper routines to rename the nodes, uh, rename extracted path to Zen path. It adds the IOMU pass through, it extends the Zen, it does the Zen specific things, and then it writes that, um, it, 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 it takes that extracted device tree and it makes it specific to what um, Zen uh, might need. And as part of its execution, you know, it can write a DTS file, but in this case, we're actually asking it to write, directly write to a DTB, because that's what we need to boot. Um, and it puts that in, in, the, in the, the proper location. And then the third, uh, in this case, uh, pipeline assist is the one that wraps that, that Zen image builder um, utility that I was mentioning, and it takes the partial device trees, um, the main host device tree, uh, there's a configuration file that, that uh, sizes things and lets us know what we need. It, it takes all those in under, it's sort of wrapped by Lopper and Python, if you will, and then it writes out what exactly uh, we need to, to do the booting. Um, I think I covered this in detail, but just to give you a flavor that, you know, each one of the assists actually has its own ability to take command line arguments. Uh, so one of the things is, you know, we tell it T the target node. So it doesn't know that you want a serial or ethernet. It just knows that there is a target node, which is where it's going to start and the device tree. You know, we have a, an I, which says, if you are walking through a device tree path and you see this node, please always bring it into the extracted device tree. 
that's how we pick up uh, uh, the Zinc MP firmware in our example, but not the root node and all the rest of the nodes. So we have a way to uh, conditionally include nodes. And then we have an X, which is exclude nodes or properties of matching reg regex. And this is how we make sure pin control and some of the other pro power domains and things that we don't want in the extracted tree, they, they never come over in this generic first step. Then has fewer options because it is much more specific. Um, we simply tell it the target node and then it finds the extracted tree and, and triggers everything based off of that information. And finally, my simple uh, image builder um, wrapper assist, which is sort of a little bit rudimentary at this point, but it just knows whether we want to do U-boot, where to look um, uh, for the output directory, which is where the config file is and, and things like that. So it will generate, uh, it, it wraps and generates what we need. So these are the three plugins that we'll be running in the demo that implement uh, this logic. So at this point, I will stop the share and I will share my, um, my terminal so we can have a look at how all of this, how this works. Okay, we should see uh, my terminal now. Hopefully we all do. Uh, Stefano will stop me if we don't. <laughs> um, what, we can, uh, what I can show here is um, if we run um, Whopper, um, I'm running it out of uh, a Git clone that I have because everybody has a Whopper Git clone available in their favorite location because um, why not? So you can see Lopper is available as cloned off device tree.org. One thing that we're going to do is we'll take the main MPSOC uh, DTS, which is our host device tree, and uh, we're going to actually write it out into this TFTP root directory NPSOC uh, uh, DTB. So that's using the Lopper core ability read a device tree, write a device tree. Um, and MP uh, will we'll show that there is nothing in this MPSOC device tree. It doesn't know anything about um, Zen. And I will manually, to make sure we boot properly, I'm going to run, um, this is the um, um, image builder uh, uh, script that Lopper will run automatically later, but I just rewrote um, the boot information uh, that is required to, in our, in our demo to boot the basic tree. Um, the way that this works is we have two QEMUs running. One is Microblaze, which is required for boot, and then we're going to boot the main uh, CP cluster. So I started the Microblaze. We switched to another terminal, which is now going to um, run this ARM64 um, main host boot, if you will. So this is using the information that was just written by Image Builder, which is the, the U-boot, the size, the DTBs, the, the configuration, uh, what, we, what we need to boot. And so what we're showing here is that the initial boot, uh, it does boot us to DOM zero, and that DOM zero will have all of the devices, as Stefano mentioned, by default, they are given to DOM zero. It has all of the devices and we will show that when we log in, we have, we have looped back, we have the, this ethernet device, which is exactly the device that we will be attempting to give to uh, DOM zero or DOM, sorry, DOM, the DOM U. And when we switch uh, to, we switch our serial input, we're now at DOM one, which is Zephyr. It's quiet. It doesn't have the timer, which is what it will be giving a timer tick if the, the timer is successfully passed through to it. And when we switch to DOM2, which is the DOM U, you can see that it has, it has no Ethernet. So there's our basic system. Um, but now in, in this workflow that we're, we're, that we're describing, and I just terminated the, the QMU session. So in, in, in the, the, the workflow that we're talking about, somebody says, I want to give a timer to Zephyr um, and I want to, uh, and then I want to give the ethernet device to, um, to DOMU. So we have the ability to run, again, back uh, where we're gonna run Lopper and we'll do uh, two, um, two executions of Lopper. The first one, We'll take the main, 
we take, we have Lopper, we're reading in that MPSOC uh, device tree that we ran, and we're writing a new one called MPSOC boot. It is chaining to the extract assist. It is telling it that the target is the timer node. Um, it's telling it to always include Zinc MP firmware, exclude the interrupt controller, exclude pin control, pin control names, power domains, current speed. Um, and again, these are things that we're leaving on the command line now to show that they're available, but this is something that you would either wrap or we could configure in potentially a domain YAML file or some other way to represent it. It then chains to extract Zen, which all we really have to tell it is the timer node is the target and we're asking it to directly write the partial uh, device tree for the timer. The run is that fast, it's that simple. Um, you can see that the main plugin said that it was dropping the mass property. Uh, it found the interrupt parent and it updated it. And then it updated the system device tree with the pass through property, which in this case is the main host device tree. And it copied and extended Zenrit. So if we do a quick diff of the main host MPSOC DTS to MPSOC boot, DTS, which is what we asked it to write. You can see the only difference is that um, the timer node had this property that we require called Zen pastor to indicate that DOM zero should not get um, that node by default. We're going to do a second run, and this is the one that completes the process in this example. And in this run, it's exactly, it's the same thing, we're, except this time we're reading the MPSOC boot DTS that we just wrote because we already have one device that's been passed through. And we're actually going to directly write the MPSOC uh, DTB required for booting. We're running extract again. This time we're telling it to look at the ethernet device, same includes, same excludes. And we're running extract send, telling it uh, to that we're looking for ethernet. It's writing the ethernet uh, DTB directly. We don't have to bounce through DTS, we can write DTB directly. And then in this second run, we're using that image builder assist I talked about to combine the MPSOC DTB, the, T, uh, the, e, the serial, and the Ethernet partial device tree into something that will be bootable. So again, you can see it ran the same way. It did some, um, in this case, we actually found um, uh, we found so, we found the pasture properties, we found the SMMU, we triggered different functionality, and then the image builder plugin, it generated Uber. So at this point, uh, we haven't interacted at all uh, by hand with uh, the various inputs to, to generate those device trees. So if we start the microblaze again, and then we attempt to boot our main thing if everything worked properly image builder took the dtbs it created the u boot uh, boot source boot information what it needed for the devices and it was all written in the right format so we're booting hopefully this finishes soon because we are running a little bit up on our time All right, but when we log in this time, eventually, all right, and we look at the devices, there is no ethernet in uh, DOM zero, and you can see Zephyr has already popped up when we switch to DOM one, which is uh, Zephyr. It, uh, don't worry, don't worry about the serial spawning things. It is now getting a timer tick because we're getting a message. And when we switch to DOM2 and we log in and we have a look, we have an Ethernet device that was passed through. And so you know, no human interaction whatsoever. Everything that Stefano talked about was automatically triggered, generated, and constructed into a bootable image. And as part of my wrap up, I just wanted to let everybody know that the, the, the components of what I was talking about, Lopper and some use cases, they are, there is a Yocto integration. You can find them in the meta virtualization layer. And we plan on doing more integration with some heterogeneous Yocto builds in the future. And that there are a series of features and different things that we're gonna do in the future. If you find this interesting or you have ideas, please reach out and let us know.
Yeah, feel free to ask questions on the chat. We'll be online. Thank you guys for listening.